Go on. Get your attention. Right, good afternoon. Thanks very much for turning up to look at our talk. Uh, my name's Ray Armstrong. You may recognise me from a photo earlier on, unconscious in the bar. That's my ugly twin. Um, and my uh, friend and also uh, co-conspirator, Alan Hewitt, we'd like to give you a bit of a presentation on how we work within the film industry. So skydiving uh, and anything associated with air, we try to get as involved as we can do. Okay. The amount of films that now want to do things for real, I mean, it's been going on for years, and everybody looks at things like Bond, etc., whereby you look at the base jump where you've got uh, B.J. Worth sort of going off there with skis and cliffs and things. People love stunts done for real. The amount of things, for example, we've done some work with, uh, with Marvel that's CGI'd. People kind of invest in it, but once it's done for real, they know that it's going to be something special. And that's where we get involved. Um, we try to get as many skydivers involved as we can, but everything then is down to the film and um, whatever it's going to be, uh, whatever the requirements are. A bit of history. So in 1999, there were 92 films in production and there were 10 film studios. In 2019, and that date is quite important because it was before all the, the crap with the, the pandemic, etc., it went up to 376 films were in, in production, so that's four times as many, and 35 studios, and there were 10 studios being built. So you can see it's an absolutely astronomical amount of growth within the film industry. Now, there's a few reasons for that. The UK um, is a very good film-friendly place to work, which we'll cover later on. The benefits to skydivers, generally speaking, everybody wants to know how much you get paid. Um, generally, it's somewhere between two and six hundred pounds a day. Um, as a skydiver, depending on the skills and depending on what you do. It can actually go up quite dramatically more than that, but depending on what you're doing, and also a thing called adjustments, whereby the more dangerous it is, then the more money you can get. So, for example, you get some base jumping, etc., whereby, I think Alan will tell you, there was a, a base jump where they were jumping off um, a Kuala Lumpur tower. Those guys got a lot of money, but then again, you know, generally speaking, we can expect to earn somewhere between 200 and 600 pounds. For the parachute centre, or wherever you are, the location, generally speaking, it's 500 quid a day to 2,000 pounds a day, depending on what they're using. Now, obviously, if you're getting somewhere more prestigious, then it's going to cost more money, but generally speaking, that's what it is, roughly. Um, when you go to places, we, we did Mission Impossible 6, where we did some filming in Abu Dhabi. Uh, when we went there, they actually want to promote it, so they actually paid us to go there, and they gave us a C-17. Thank you very much, Mr. Cruz. Three of us in the back of a C-17. Ha, <laughs> life is good. Oh, sorry, and also then, sorry, the publicity. So one, one thing with skydiving, etc. we love it as a skydiving, if you've got a parachute centre, every time something happens on there, somebody watches a movie and they think, I want to do that. Most of the people think, I want to go base jumping. The amount of, as a tandem instructor, what do you want to do then, mate? Oh, I want to go base jumping. Anyway, strap yourself to the front of me and let's go and do a safe skydive. <laughs> So why is it growing? Uh, there are tax benefits. That's not for us. That's for the film industry. So the film companies, they get some tax benefits. Uh, there are film-friendly policies. <laughs> I couldn't say that last night. Um, whereby <laughs> they're trying to promote it. Because uh, anything that's done within the UK, the, the, the industry is a multi-billion pound kind of industry globally. And we want to try and get as much of that as we can. And when you think about it, it's, uh, it's a great way to make money. Because all we're doing is producing something you can see. So it's not physically there, but um, it, it makes good money. Um, within the UK as well, we've got a lot of interesting places. So for example, we've just finished uh, filming uh, Mission 7. And it goes on. People go, oh my God, when's he going to stop? When people stop giving him billions to watch his films, then he'll stop. So it's going to carry on. We're working on Mission 8 at the moment. So Mission 7, we did some filming in, um, in Norway. Uh, there wasn't quite enough uh, footage. So then where did we go? Lake Buttermere in the Lake District. So then we set up there and we started uh, throwing shapes at, at the wind, jumping out of squirrel helicopters in Buttermere. So uh, we've got some fantastic locations. We do have some restrictions, of course, because we're the UK, that's the way we are, but it is, there's some stunning places around the place. I mean, we're currently looking at uh, filming in Africa, but then they're also saying, and if it doesn't work in Africa, let's go to Scotland. 
Okay, that's similar. <laughs> Um, we have award-winning cast and crew, we do. We have a hell of a lot of talent. I mean, uh, the one thing, once again, we keep referring to Mr. Cruz because that's the guy we tend to work with most. But even uh, a couple of years ago with Mr. Milne there, we worked uh, with uh, Scarlett Hansen and we did uh, the Black Widow film, the Marvel film, and that's all in Pinewood, that's all in London. So all, of this, all that footage was all done uh, locally. So uh, we have world-class studios, and we genuinely do. If you go into Leavesden, where the, the world of Harry Potter, it was hilarious because we had a wind tunnel. We built the biggest wind tunnel in the world. We put it in the car lot uh, by the side of the world of Harry, Harry Potter, and every now and again, we'd, uh, we'd go up with a broom, so it looked like we were playing Quidditch, and we'd fly, and these kids, it's Quidditch, and it was just us dicking around. So um, we do have some fantastic facilities there. And when you look at what's filmed uh, at the end of these uh, amazing films where you think that they're probably in the States, etc., and you look, it'll be in London, it'll be somewhere around there. The only thing that we do have an issue with is we don't have film-friendly skydiving operations manual. I mean, it's not taking a slot at British skydiving. It's because it's what it is. It's a sport. But what we tried to do, because we thought initially when we were setting up to... Because um, when Mr. Cruz comes along and he wants to do something, it's unusual. And we can't turn up at, at the average skydiving centre and lob him in a caravan and sort of lob him out. We need to do something a bit special. And unfortunately, privacy is absolutely everything. And when you meet the head of security for Tom, Mario, he would have a fit. And he's 80-second airborne. He'll just start shooting people. So what we need is something whereby uh, we need to set up a DZ. Now, although within the British Parachute Association or the uh, British Skydiving Operations Manual, it refers to a temporary DZ. So we thought, ah, great, we can set up. And then we can start... Um, setting up a little parachute centre away from a normal parachute centre just for us to do nothing outrageous, just normal skydiving. It didn't then lend itself to it. Now, we appreciate um, that there are issues with regards to it because we have to do something special, but what we would like to do is start addressing that because then we can do... The, the film industry then would do more work. We'd do more skydiving. We'd be do more, more stunts, etc. So what we want to try and do is get that so it's more into the mainstream of British skydiving and getting you people, more people throwing shapes at the wind and getting on TV. Um, my part. <laughs> okay, not quite sure what's happening to the uh, screen, but uh, hopefully we can work through it. Um, my main job is putting a team together. And when I'm putting a team together, believe it or not, it's one of the hardest jobs I've got. It's not coordinating the stunt. It's not getting the equipment or modifying it. It's actually finding the people who happen to be available who have the skills we need at the time. And everyone says, I'm available, use me. The thing is, I've got a bad memory, so I forget who said that two years ago. So I start going for my Facebook list, other people I don't use, and say, oh yeah, he's got some skills, or somebody who's high profile. Uh, it is the hardest job I've got, because it's normally had to be done on a really tight dead, uh, deadline. But everybody knows what we need is, obviously, we need skydivers, we need packers, we need riggers, uh, and sometimes we need stunt doubles, you know, um, and that's even harder to find. When we're looking for stunt doubles, we're not necessarily asking for somebody who looks exactly like the actors. We're asking somebody for the right height, the right body build, so basically we can put them in and double up for the actors themselves. Uh, and we need a camera team. Uh, th th these are pretty obvious. This is what we need to make a film, uh, a skydiving sequence anyway. Um, now, where do we go for this talent? Well... Like every stunt coordinator in the world right now, they use the same people over and over again. So it's hard to get into the stunt industry as a whole. Um, and that's because they haven't got time to take a chance on somebody new. And the reason that is, if somebody comes in and says, right, we're doing the sequence, and they've worked with somebody for a year or two years, they know their ability, they know they can do the job. So I do the same. When I'm looking for a team, I tend to hire the same people. Um, but obviously we haven't got all the skills within the small group of people uh, we use here. So we go outside and we bring somebody who's got specific skills to do a specific job, and hopefully they've got more than one talent. It always turns out that whoever we hire has got a specific skill, the director will change at the last minute and say, do this, and suddenly he's not doing a head down, uh, 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 flying around and spinning around somebody, suddenly he's on his belly wearing a camera. You know, and people have to be adapt to what it is. And it's always last minute changes. So I like people who've got multiple talents, all round talents. Um, but also we need people with those specific skills, really high skills as well. Um, I then go through my CVs. Over the years I've, I've built up a whole bunch of CVs that people set, said to me. So I go through my list of CVs. Uh, all right, contact this person, is he available? Uh, yes, no, and I can move on from there. Um, high profile skydivers we all know and I'm like oh yeah he's just won the world championships or they've just done this let's give them a bell we need to bring them in 
Now, I'm talking about British skydivers generally, but I use people from all over Europe. Um, but generally, in England, if the film is here, then we want to use somebody local. If we haven't got the skill here who's available, and I can't find him in that short notice, uh, then I do bring him in from the States, and I do bring him in for everywhere else. Um, so I look for high-profile skydivers. Um, I go for my Facebook page looking for people, but the, the key thing is we need availability. Who can leave the job they're doing instantly, within a week or two weeks, and suddenly go on a film for two or three months? It's not easy finding uh, that, uh, that people who are available there. Um, now, who are our competitors? Well, it's quite easy, really. US stunt teams. Most of the films are made in America. So the US stunt teams have a core skydiving group who get all the American film jobs. So when a film comes up and says, right, we're doing this in the UK now, the producers still tend to go back to America to do the skydiving sequence because they haven't actually got faith in what we can do in the UK. Thankfully, Tom Cruise has helped them prove that wrong. We can do everything in the UK, and we've done some amazing stuff in the UK. So we're now starting to educate all the producers and the directors and the stunt coordinators in the UK that they don't have to keep doing it in America. And, and my, my dream is to bring more and more TV and film work here for the skydivers, for the drop zone, and do it here in the UK. Quite often I say, yeah, I'll take this job on, I can do it. We've got to go to, uh, uh, to Portugal or Spain or Czech Republic. I've got to somewhere else because we can't do it here. And it's a shame because I want to do it here in the UK. So it depends on the job. US stunt teams get most of the work, but we've started to take a lot of that off them now, and it's growing. Um, High-profile skydiving teams, everyone knows Red Bull. Red Bull pay for marketing with, with the biggest budget on the world, I think. Um, I actually lost a job last year. I actually was just about to sign the contract, and the production manager came in, oh, Alan, stop, stop, we've got to change the plan. Well, what's the change of plan? Yeah, yeah, the producer just spoke to Red Bull. They're going to provide a Red Bull team to do this job, and uh, Red Bull are paying them. I can't compete with that, you know. I want paying. I'm not going to pay to do the job. So they are a high-profile skydown team. They get the benefits of that sponsorship because then they can say they've done the film and Red Bull get, makes more sales. So that's a competitor as well, people who want to do marketing within a film. Um, our competitors are also in the stunt register. Every stunt team around the UK has got somebody in their team who have done some skydiving. Right? And the stunt coordinator who knows nothing about skydiving will say, hey, uh, we need this, can you help out? Oh yeah, I know a mate or my AFF instructor can do this. And they'll do it by word of mouth. So that is a competitor. But the stunt coordinators look at this uh, uh, stunt register, uh, as uh, they call it the book of lies. Uh, because everybody in there has got a photo of them skydiving, and then you realise they're on, you know, the level seven uh, in there. So it's not showing their high performance. So the register I've been trying to build up shows their real skill of what they can and cannot do. And there's quite a few times I've been told, yeah, we've got a guy, we want you to use him. You're the skydiving coordinator, but I want you to use one of my stuntmen. I'm, oh, give me a CV. I found out he hasn't jumped for 20 years. He said he's jumped Halo in the military. He's never been in the military. And <laughs> I was like, come on, you know, and he said, no, 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 he's good at what he does, I, I, I can get the evidence. Send me a logbook, send me a, anything you can send me. And in the end, I said, definitely not, not doing it. We just go away, I don't care what you think he's good at or what he is good at, I want evidence, I want proof. Because, you know, at the end of the day, I'm saying we're doing this job safely and I've got to write the risk assessments and report back to the health and safety at work and anybody else if it goes wrong. Uh, so the stunt register is, I never look for skydivers in that. But it's nice to know stunt men who do do skydiving. And I've come across a few lately who are actually pretty good. But if they're pretty good in, in, as a stuntman, they don't get away skydiving much at all. If they're really good as a skydiver, uh, then obviously they're not getting a lot of stunt work. So there's a balance there you've got to try and find. Um, what production companies do, they go to what's called an IMD database. Uh, and, and this is all the, the films I've been involved with, uh, me and Ray's been involved with. Um, and, and I've just taken a selection out to show you that this is where they get credibility. The, um, the production manual will go on IMDB, he'll search for your name, and then he'll look at what you've done, because everything here has been independently verified by IMDB. You've said, I've been part of a film, they will check it out, they will contact the film company and say, yes, it's right, then they'll allow your name to go on the list and, the, and your job title. So when you're putting in your name, your job title, it then comes back and they decide, well, yeah, that's correct, and then they'll allow it. And so that is the only evidence that production companies have that you can do what you say you do. 
So the big production companies always do this. I've hired people and I've had a phone call from production. I can't find him on IMDb. Now he's not on IMDb, but we need him. Trust me. All right, well, you're the coordinator. You're taking all responsibility. You know, so I, I, you can overrule that, but that's their first port of call. As I said, word of mouth. They like to know people. I get most of my jobs for word of mouth now because people know me. I've been doing it a long time. Uh, they know the results we've achieved. So word of mouth is the, the first way of doing things. Um, however, we're also working with competing departments. We haven't just got competitors. Or we've got competing departments. For example, the stunt department want to do for, for real, but some of the stunt coordinators do not want to do it for real. They say, no, we're going to do the same thing. We'll use blue screen. We'll use a wind tunnel. We'll fake it because we can control it. And they sell it to the director. I want this job, and I'm going to do it in the studios. And if I come up and talk to production, I said, I want this job, and I want to do it for real. But if you want a wind tunnel, we can do that as well. You know? So I'm trying to open it up uh, and go from there. Special effects, however, compete with the stunt department. Now, these all work for the same film. They're all getting paid by the same film company, and the director has to decide who he uses. Do I use the stunt department? Do I use special effects? And then they'll both put a budget in of what they can do to create the same storyboard, and then the director has to decide which way he goes. So that's still a competitor. Um, and visual effects, even more so now. Visual effects say you don't need any skydivers, you don't need a, a stunt team, we'll do it all. So if you're doing Black Widow, you know, they don't need a skydiving team because as soon as we do all the skydiving in the wind tunnel, it can look amazing and great, then they edit it to make sure it's never been done for real in the first place. So on their level, they, they want the job. And they'll put a budget in and go from there. Props always get it wrong. <laughs> shouldn't say that. <laughs> but they always find equipment which is not suitable for the job they're doing. So I now work a lot with props. They don't compete for the job, but actually they, they do compete and say, we have to provide all the equipment, and they don't know what they're buying, so we have to advise them anyway. And if you've got a good prop um, uh, head of department, uh, it's brilliant, because he will contact you and say, what do I need? Where do I get it from? If you've got somebody who just calls up a local prop company, I need some parachutes, they'll send him some parachutes, and he'll just accept what he's get given and go from there. So there's lots of different departments are competing, um, and we have to liaise with them all, uh, basically. And now I'll have to you back to Ray. Um, it's funny what Alan was saying there about the, the props department. Uh, when we first turned up, he, he gave me a call. He said, oh, I'm off to Leavesden. I'm going to go and see an uh, you know, interview with Mr. Cruz and um, talk about Mission 6. Fantastic. He phoned me up. He goes, they've got a wind tunnel. And I was like, what? He goes, they bought a wind tunnel. So even without talking to any skydivers or whatever, they installed a wind tunnel and we just turned up. It's there, staffed. So you've got guys, ninja, free flyers, and you think, wow, incredible. So they're not afraid to spend the money. Uh, also, uh, there was a little snap there whereby Mr. Cruz, he got in, he goes, well, that's not very big. It's like, well, that's the biggest wind tunnel you can have. He goes, I want a lot bigger. So the next thing you know, uh, make it this. And they drew it on a fag packet, and they made the biggest, what then was the biggest wind tunnel in the world. So it was then seven meters by three and a half meters, and it was just built for that to train in. We didn't use it for the film, we just trained him in it. So they're not afraid to spend some money, but then if you want to do an hour's overtime, oh my God, do they nail you down. <laughs> right, so um, we've already alluded to it. I am, I'm not even the best skydiver in the room, let alone the best skydiver in, in the world. But what you need is skills that relate to that. And also, Alan's touched on it, whereby if you've got, the more skills you've got, the more usable you are. So for example, I'm an advanced rigger. I'm an instructor examiner. I'm a tandem instructor. I'm an AFF instructor. Uh, I make beanbags. You know, so I literally, I, anything you want, I can turn my hand to it. Would I be brilliant at it? You know, some of them, yes. Making beanbags, yes. You're free flying, maybe not so much. But having a number of skills, you can turn your hand to it. So for example, um, we had a stunt where um, one of my first jobs with Mission was to repair, completely rebuild a rig because the stunt team had grabbed the wrong rig and they dragged a guy around the car park to see what it would look like to drag somebody, but in a brand new container. So not a stunt container, a brand new container. I had to completely re rebuild the reserve container. Great, that was done. Next thing you know, somebody had taken a Stanley knife to it because the Mission Impossible thing is they, they have to do a, a face printer. They, they've always got a, a face printer with Tom looks like somebody else. Fantastic. And they got this and said, oh, where's it going to go? They literally took a scalpel or a Stanley knife, opened up the container again, lobbed it into it, that's where it is. That was the next job I did. So 
having the multiple skills, that's great. Also, Alan's alluded to the fact that uh, Roz, when she was working on mission, uh, so not on Black Widow, her job was back flying. Now, she's a belly flyer. So she's a national champion belly flyer, and they put her on her back. So she spent weeks learning how to back fly, and then they decided, actually, do you know what? You look more like Scarlett Johansson than the other woman. So they flipped it around. So then they put it onto her belly. So literally, it was something whereby she spent a month learning how to back fly, and then ended up on her belly. So you've got to be multi-talented, if you can be. We mentioned equipment skills. Uh, also, um, Alan's a, a rigger examiner. I'm an advanced rigger. We got um, Karen Saunders. She's an advanced rigger now. She's a rigger examiner. So we've got a lot of talent. There's uh, Alex as well, Alex Hewitt. He's a rigger. So we've got a lot of people that can make it because we do it for real. Uh, when we were jumping in Iceland, we were working on a, um, a, a TV series there jumping and they the props department had made bizarre what they deemed to be parachutes they were ridiculous they got something like five lines attached to them it was, it was basically just fabric so they can drag it around and containers that they could only be filmed from a distance but when it comes down to the real stuff of course then you need real riggers that can do a real job um, when it comes down to skydiving coordination uh, i've dipped into it and alan always puts me down as i'm the assistant skydiving coordinator oh my god God, it's mind-numbingly awful to coordinate because you've got a lot of people who don't understand skydiving and they're trying to say they want something and it then it's something like Alan that then needs to sort of put it all together and then translate it into people like myself and Ali Milne where we want to do the job, but people are trying to stop us. So with Marvel, for example, they kept telling us off saying, why do you have to keep being in the wind tunnel? Don't you guys already know what you're doing? Well, we have never flown with guns before. We've never wore these bizarre masks before. So the training side of things, it's down to the coordinator then to give us that time. Uh, set etiquette is ridiculously important. And it sounds like a bit of a sort of a mouthful. But ultimately speaking, it's knowing what you can and can't do. So for example, I'm not known as the quietest bloke in the world. I'm not the bloke that kind of sits on the fence and doesn't sort of come up with an opinion. But if you're going to give an opinion, it better be right, and you're going to make sure that you can back it up, because people will turn on it and then say, so you're doing this. I mean, literally, to turn around when they said, come on, because something wasn't working in the wind tunnel. And I said, oh, but Tom, you'll be able to do it for real. Woof. Everybody turns around. You think we can do this for real? Oh, crap. I've got to back it up. And hey, presto, we did. So thankfully, I'm still in the job. Um, with the budgeting side of things, once again, that's nothing to do with me. Pay me, I'll turn up, I'll teach you how to skydive, I'll make things, I'll do whatever. But once you start talking about budgeting, budgeting is so important. They'll tell you at the beginning of a film what they think, or you've got to tell them what you think it's going to cost. And you've got no idea. They won't even tell you what the stunt is. So they come up with these fictitious figures, and then you have to try and make it match to that. Um, every film, I think, how much was it budgeted for? Something like two million initially on Mission 6, and it ended up being 30 million. Yeah, well, there you go. So, you know, as in the total film. So it was a 150 million film that was 225 million to build it in the end. So the budgets are the budgets, but they'll let it creep um, if it's necessary for the film, uh, i.e. if you get a, a star that breaks his ankle jumping into a wall, then it will suddenly delay it. I mean, when they're filming, it's 600 grand a day. And when we were in Abu Dhabi, it was supposed to be sort of about three weeks' work, and it ended up being six weeks' work. So you can do the maths on that one. I mean, it was eye-watering money when they're, when they're actually doing it for real. When it comes to the rules and regulation, um, you think that we've got a lot to deal with when it comes down to British skydiving. You've got the operations manual. So, for example, Alan and I were working at Hinton Skydiving Centre, test jumping some kit, um, and Alan has a, a manual that's three times the size of the operations manual that we have to adhere to because we're working for a film. So it's not just the BPAs or the BS's manual, we've got our operations manual, we've got our risk assessment, etc. that then is signed off by Paramount just so we can go and do two skydives at Hinton Skydiving Centre. That's the way it is. Loads of laughs. So when it comes down to all of this, when you look at what comes into doing it for real, there is an astronomical amount behind the scenes, if you like, before we can step out of an aeroplane. And when you think the money that was spent by mission, but the sequence, the whole sequence, was four minutes. Now, when we just did Black Widow, that sequence for what we were used for was even less than that. It was unbelievably tiny, but there was millions spent on it. Um, but in the background, 
there's all this stuff whereby they will insist. I mean, when we, once again, working with Mission, they've got Paramount's head of uh, risk assessment and risk management, this woman called uh, Angela. She doesn't miss a thing. And everything we're doing, like, for example, people can't get into an aeroplane if they're not necessarily to be in the aeroplane. You will not be allowed to jump. So, for example, we're going to do a jump, etc. If your job there is not to step out and do work, even if you're in the aircraft, you can't jump because then you've increased their risk. And that's the way that they work. There's a number of things that we, we do. So, for example, whereas it used to be just skydiving, now, of course, speed flying, base jumping, paragliding. So, the last mission movie, uh, there was some base jumping involved, and Mr. Cruise. It was one of the most spectacular stunts I've ever seen, one of the most spectacular things I've ever seen. So when it comes to Mission 7, when you see what he was doing, it was incredible. But then, of course, you need top base jumpers. Now, I've done a few base jumps, but I'm far from a top base jumper. So there, hey presto, we, we wheel out the, the Red Bull team. So the Red Bull base team, there they were, teaching Tom how to do it. When it comes down to speed flying, um, Alan's just been working on a, a series, an Amazon series, uh, with Richard Madden, whereby that will be released, I think, this year, late, this year it starts? Yep. So then what you've now got is UK, a UK organisation, if you like, doing like a James Bond-esque series. And if this first one works well, it's going to go on and on and on and on. Now, we actually did a trial whereby we took Richard Madden and threw him in a wind tunnel to see what he looked like facially, because when um, we did some work on um, the... What was that film where you with the tunnel? Anyway, the star looked atrocious in freefall. Yeah, infinite, that's it, because their face was flapping all over the place. So they put him into a wind tunnel just to see does Richard Madden still look good in freefall? And then it was like, yes, he does. Thank God for that. Because then in the, in the next series, next year, hopefully when we're filming, Richard Madden will be there because he looks good in freefall as well as on the ground. Um, the paragliding things, et cetera, what we needed, um, there was the same series, um, there was a crash sequence whereby you got the baddies being shot and then guys hitting trees and things. So they gave us a man-sized dummy with brand new parachutes, with automatic towing equipment, and we were hauling up a body with Alan there sort of with a remote control steering this guy and then into a tree. Now the beauty was... We took it to a field near my house and we were lobbing up bodies and then throwing them into trees and people thought, you know, people were dying. It, it was fantastic. Um, when it comes down to doubles, um, yeah. hello, showing a bit of leg, nice. What you tend to find with air is, once again, that's, um, you're not going to be looking exactly like the person. I mean, if you are, great, but you're looking similar to the person that, that, that they need. So, for example... Um, I had a, 10 kilos more, so I was doubling Ray Winston on the last one, Mr. Mr. Drakoff. Um, but what you find is then, they put a whole load of dots and whatever around you, and I wore some funky glasses, and it's just anything that then, they can sort of match it to you in the way it's moving. And then they just morph your face, or their, their face into your face, and that's the way it goes. But roughly speaking, you've got to be the same size. Uh, with Mission 6, we needed somebody to double for Henry Carvel, Superman. He is a god. He's like six foot odd tall. Uh, Henry Carvel, bit of a dude. I don't know a single skydiver his shape. So uh, they had a, a body suit that Rusty Lewis had to then learn to fly. So he was wearing all this outrageous flesh, making him look like Superman. But then his flying skills had to be adapted to it because it completely changed his body. Also, he was wearing all this rubber. And where do we go? Abu Dhabi, 40 degrees. He lost even more weight. Unbelievable. Okay, when it comes down to the camera equipment, we jump some bizarre things. Now, as skydivers, we're used to GoPros, etc. Oh my God, the cameras that we use are incredible. So we're used to filming in 4K. Well, this is 8K, and when we've got IMAX cameras, the, the lens is 55 grand. And the body is another 50-odd grand. You're talking 110 grand for a camera. And not just that, you have to have a technician with you as well that then is five grand a day. To hire these cameras is five grand a day. And we've dropped one. So on deployment, uh, off it goes, 110 grand. Bye. The memory stick is three and a half grand. And it only records half an hour. So, uh, and in, in my time, I've only been working with Alan for five years on movies. In my time, we dropped two. <laughs> <laughs> oh. 
But all they do is go around, are you okay? Yeah, great. They extract the, uh, the footage and they, they actually, they're over them. Oh, brilliant. So basically now they've got a video of somebody going in because that's what it would be. So um, they're, they're damned expensive, but they do an amazing job because they need to do a technical job. So when it comes down to um, the quality that they film in, that's why then when you present it into a, a cinema, you know, if it was on a GoPro, it would look grainy at that size. Whereas it was with an IMAX camera, wow. Yeah, you've got quality. Uh, this bizarre camera in the middle here, now everybody now has got 360 cameras, you know, great. Well, that was an IMAX quality 360 camera, and that's barking mad. And the funny thing is, when uh, there was the assistant to Wade Eastwood, who's the overarching uh, stunt coordinator, and when she saw Alan with the camera, she was ducking. He was like, what are you ducking for? Everybody's in shot. That's the way it is. But then you need special uh, software to kind of edit it. Um, this one up here as well, that's what Alan used to jump um, before they started getting these really nice funky cameras. But that was the quality of camera because it was a real, uh, a real film camera, whereas now it's digital, but high quality digital. Also, this one in here, by the way, um, can you imagine wearing that on your head? And that's why it's 110 grand. You know, you start looking at all of this, and they even put sort of a viewfinder over the eye. And then when you look at the cameraman, uh, Craig, uh, so this one here, he's wearing oxygen as well. So we're at 25,000 feet. He's going out backwards, doing a whole sequence beforehand with that, with oxygen, with that lens, and walking out backwards and filming Tom Cruise out the back of a C-17. Man, the guy's good. He can also tap dance. <laughs> yeah, I'd just like to add that when we had the uh, risk assessment for potentially losing camera equipment, it was out in the desert. We wouldn't do that other drop zone. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, move on. Uh, most of my job now is uh, the R&D department on a, on a film stunt, whatever we're doing. Everybody wants something new. They don't want normal. A big budget film does not want normal. They'll turn around, right, we're going to do a halo jump. Oh, brilliant, no problem, that's easy to organise. No, it's not. We want a full face helmet. We want, it, we want, it's lit, want lights inside it. We want Tom's face to be seen. Oh, bugger. You know, and then all of a sudden now, you've got oxygen inside a helmet, full face helmet, and you've got electrics in there, battery and everything else. The last thing we want to do is get a short in one of the lights and burn his face or something during free fall. So the design and testing we went through was massive. And then we actually got it kite marked in the end. In the UK, we had it independently tested. Uh, we contacted all the helmet manufacturers and said, this is what we're doing, we want a full face one. Two of them come back and said, yeah, we've got one. We looked into it. No, they didn't, you know, and, and they didn't know what we wanted of the film. So I went back to the producers in the end saying, we have to design our own. So basically, we start from scratch. Um, so a lot of things we do, sometimes we, we see what's out there. If it's available, we can use it. If it's not, and if it's not film friendly the way we need it, because the look is important, then we start from scratch. We design, build, test it, approve it, and then we put it into use. So this oxygen equipment was quite unique. It was one of the, uh, uh, one of the successes I, I've really enjoyed being part of. Um, the motorbike stunt, we're dropping the motorbike out, and you'll see a quick video later. You know, we're out in Salisbury Plain. We drop a motorbike from a helicopter. We've got somebody in free fall filming it. It falls at the same speed as a skydiver, and it's pretty stable. It was quite nice. And we got the ADs to deploy the bike about 200 feet in the end on its wheels, landed, and it just moved forwards and then fell over. We drove it back. So, of course, a lot of the things we do, it is not normal skydiving, we're testing equipment for a specific job. We designed and built that and tested it, and it was very successful. Went over to Norway to do the actual stunt, and when we had a 100-foot ledge for this to land on, uh, because we went 3,000 feet off a, a top ledge, a 100-foot ledge to land on, a 1,000 foot below it, and then we had another 2,000 feet, which we didn't want to, the bike to get into. So we had to deploy it 200 feet above this ledge and land on the ledge. We didn't want it to escape. Well, that 100-foot ledge when we got there was 10 foot. <laughs> and I'm like, no. So we, we got together and we had a quick jump and said, let's do some test jumps. Well, we can't. We've got no bikes here. We've only got the real ones. Uh, so quickly, we decided, well, let's put the parachute onto a rock and drop that out, see if that will work. It wasn't successful. Those last-minute changes meant the whole project failed. And in the end, I was like, if that bike opens at 2,000 feet and it doesn't land on a ledge, it's going on the main road, it's going into the cattle, it's going into a housing estate. We can't do it, you know, I can't take the risks. Now, I actually suggested in the beginning, it's not a problem, we'll build a radio control system in it. Uh, and initially, that, that's a brilliant idea, because at least we can then guide it down and fly it to where we want to land, where we want it to land. I was overruled. 
no, no, we're not spending that. You know, make it happen. So I had to go back to the stunt coordinator. Says the best thing to happen, just let the bikes crash in where they crash. No parachutes. And he goes, how do I go back to the producer now and say we spent all this money but we're not using it? Well, that's above my pay grade. Sorry, Wade. You know, this is if I'd have had the right uh, DZ Recky, the right person doing the job. Uh, who, who was the Norwegian stunt coordinator at that time, uh, if he'd have known what we was doing. Uh, so it's a communication thing here as well. So we've not always had successes, we've had failures. But I can get that bike to open 200 feet above the ground easily. So, we, you know, it's pretty good. So the R&D side is always something new. And a big budget film wants something new every single time. Um, when you're working with production companies, and just to move on a bit now, you've got large movies. You know, 300 million plus for a film is, is quite normal now. Um, Bond pay some of the big, got some of the biggest budgets out there, and Mission is just saying we are not competing with Bond. We're not going to spend what Bond pay. You know, so the, the the producers look at it and say, right, we've got this film, 100 million, let's make it work. I don't know if they ever make it on budget, to be honest. It always changes. Um, a typical budget movie, 100 million, but small budget movie is 10 million. There's a lot of work can come from a film to skydiving with a 10 million budget still. So that's what we keep. We should be chasing. As, an, as a skydiving community. Um, if it's a big budget film, they want custom equipment, they want team training. You can say, I need a four week training camp. And okay, no problem, where do you want to go? What do you want to do? Uh, they've got a dedicated previs. So when you're training, you've got to match their previs, their pre-visualization, they, they edit a video together, it's like a cartoon script. You look at that and now you've got to create that in free fall for real. So we get the previous. This is a big budget film. They're willing to pay for that, which is nice. And I like working on big budget films, so I tend to focus on them now. Uh, but our TV companies, you know, Netflix, three, three million per episode, for example, is their budget for an episode. So I just worked on Citadel, which is coming out in February. It's a speed flying sequence. I'm like, it's an inflatable wing. It's similar conditions to what we've got. We have to be weather wise. You get the right team on board. We, we can make this work. Um, so. With the TV companies, you know that their budget's going to be even tighter. Uh, and so when I'm going back to them and I'm saying, this is the budget we need, right, can we do it differently? Can we get rid of those people? We'll do that stunt with them, and then we'll increase that two people to seven people. <laughs> you know, so they're always looking to cheat it, to make it cheaper. So you've got a budget for something, but you've got to negotiate on what you want to put forwards. TV adverts, anything from 10,000 plus. Um, on those jobs, though, they want standard equipment, typical skydivers, easy storyboards, the local drop zone. They don't want us to go to the CAA and open a brand new drop zone just for the film. Last year, I opened three drop zones in the UK um, just, for, just for the film work. I had a temporary open for two weeks, four weeks, eight weeks in one of them. Um, I opened them. We worked directly with the CAA, not British skydiving. Um, and at the end of it, we then closed that drop zone down. Three times last year I had to do that. Uh, it's a big budget film. The small budget films don't have the budget for that. And this is where we're missing out. This is where we as skydivers are missing out. We can definitely get the uh, British skydiving or the drop zone a bit more film friendly. We could get more work in the UK rather than letting it go to America. Um, if I get the job and I don't want it to go to America, but I can't do it in the UK, then I take them abroad. You know, we, we go Denmark, we, we, we've been to Czech Republic, we've been all over the place. Um, and I have to take them abroad, because I know I can do it in that country, because they are film friendly. And that's something we need to look at to get more work here in the UK. The infrastructure, obviously, if it's a big budget, I, I worked out at the CA. So as, as Ray said, the ops manual, it's not my ball game, make an ops manual, but I have to write it. I have to get the risk assessment done. Uh, I have to get the SOPs done. I have to contact Paramount and say, this is what we're doing. But then I want the Health and Safety and Work Act is massive. So I'll get a Health and Safety at Work specialist on. So as a rigging examiner, I'll do all the equipment. As an instructor examiner, rail, I'll, I'll do all the, the skydiving section. Um, we've got Mark Briggs involved. He's a Health and Safety Specialist, Health and Safety at Work Act, to make us legally compliant. It's very important now, and I have to bring all this together. So working with the CAA uh, and putting an instructor together, it, it, we do a lot more paperwork, and it's massive. Um, we tell them we're using custom equipment. We're using very unique sequences. It's not like you're doing normal. And then in the beginning, the CAA was a bit nervous. After five or six films, now I call them up. Hey, we're doing this. Yeah, I want a clearance for Monday, and this is Friday evening. Right, yeah, we need clearance for this new, this new drop zone on Monday. Alan, no problem, I'll sign it off on Monday morning. 
and, uh, and I send the paperwork over and I get it. And it's unheard of. Nobody, and nobody's ever heard of getting a drop zone cleared that quick anywhere. But it is possible once you build up a good relationship, you show the standards you're working to, and they've got evidence of that. If you want to open a drop zone temporary uh, direct with the CAA, you pay your money, you put the application fee in, it's going to be between 30 and 90 days before they give you approval, and they will investigate everything. That's what happened in the beginning with us. We've now whittled that down because we've got history with them, and it does work. Um, I tell them we've got the top athletes. I tell them what we're doing, so I inform the CAA on everything. I tell them we've got our own insurance policy, mega important, so we still meet their requirements. So we don't have to work with British skydiving because we don't fit into the operations manual. I go from there. The small budget films, I say, I take them abroad. I've got, I've got no option when it's a small budget film. It's cheaper to take people abroad, do the job, than do it in here. But we need to change that. You know, we need local uh, skydivers, and they would, they would love that here in the UK. But you've got to look at who, who are your employers. And your employers, are, are quite simply, it's, um, <coughs> uh, if it's a TV thing, some researcher will just go on the internet, look up skydiving stunt work. Whatever they get back, they'll call the local drop zone. And then that's, you know, that's the level of that work that's being done. And whoever's on the phone, they can either sell it to them or they can lose it. So that's what they do. So look for websites. There's TV researchers. If a producer calls you, you know it's a small budget film because a producer won't call somebody up saying, I've got this film. And what you, they'll, they'll ask their stunt coordinator. Um, production managers will always start with IMDb. So people, you know where people start looking and go from there. They will ask people. They want word of mouth. That they don't want to do any research. They just want to know somebody who's been recommended to them. And stunt, stunt coordinators, same thing. They'll ask a colleague. They'll go on to IMDb. They'll ask other stunt coordinators what's been done and what was this guy like, what was this team like, and, and so from there. Um, so the CAA have been absolutely amazing over the past four years. I cannot praise them enough. Without them, we would not have been able to do the job. They have been superb. So they're getting film friendly, but we still have to do a lot of paperwork uh, to, to make it happen. Um, 30 days notice is easy now. I say I've done it in five days, I've done it in two days. Uh, it's really good. British skydiving is committee-based, so it cannot be film-friendly. I ask for an exemption for SDC, I wait six months, I go to the committee, well, no, sorry, and then we, we start again. So in the last 20 years, I've never gone to SDC now, and I, it, it hasn't changed in the last 20 years, so I'll never go and ask for an exemption, it just very rarely works. So we have to work in the BPA on a drop zone, or we go abroad, or we set our own drop zone up. We've got three options, um, let me go from there. However, to move forwards, we need British skydiving either to be movie-friendly or we need the CAA to be more movie-friendly. If that was available, DZ would get more work in the UK because you've just seen all the, all the uh, film companies are getting more and more work. There's 35 new studios uh, being built as we speak. So 22, 35 existing, 22 being built as we speak. So the industry is growing. Everybody wants to come to the UK. We can get a massive chunk of this work here if we was more film-friendly. Something we need to look at as an association, as a CAA. I'm trying to bring that work here in the UK. I don't want to go abroad. I'm sick of travelling. <laughs> That's my way of looking at it. Um, I've created this guy to have a stunt register, because uh, uh, this is what every stunt coordinator wants. They want your name, your weight, your height, your size, all this. So when I ask for CB, I send people, I need all this information. They always demand three photos. A full body photo, uh, an action photo, and a head and shoulders photo. Uh, but if you, if you lie on your CV, it will can't stand out instantly, and you've lost the job before you get it. So, I mean, I've only got 8,000 jumps. I, I hire people with 12,000, 20,000, 30,000 for a specific skill or their jobs. But I've got a good all-round experience. I've done a lot of weird and uh, different things. So I say what I'm good at and go from there. So this is my skydiving CV. And if you want to be in a film job, you need to put a skydiving CV in a similar layout. Um, I've also got an IMDB profile, so they can look me up on my film work as well. Um, so on my website now, I've got a stunt register. So I'm trying to copy the stunt industry and say this is a skydiving stunt register because it's always hard to find people. So what I tell people is, fill this in, send me the details. You might not get a job a year or two years, but suddenly two years later, I'll get a job and I'll be looking through this. I'm like, ah, let me give them a call. So that stunt register works and skydiving register can work as well. Um, so I think we've, we've, we've finished that now, but I'm going to show you a little video. But while the video's on, it's, it's just a video by itself. We can have a question and answers uh, uh, section, if anyone's got any questions as well. There's no audio on this. So you can see some of the stuff that we have been involved with. It's more importantly, this is stunts we've recreated and what we do behind the scenes uh, at the, the back of the day. 
So, well, it's 11 minutes long, and I don't think we've got 11 minutes left. So um, I think we need to start uh, question and answers. Anybody got any uh, questions to us? What's that? That's a, re <laughs> that's a recreation of uh, Ronnie O'Brien's stunt. Uh, we had to recreate We had to recreate it for uh, 999 series. And putting her tandem into a deliberate spin took a lot of thinking out. We didn't want to drove around his neck, so we had to slightly do it differently. Wind tunnel work. You know, we do a lot of wind tunnel work now, so we've got the biggest wind tunnel in the world here. We go from there. Anyone, any questions for me? Can I have a job? <laughs> <laughs> fill in the register. So, yeah, fill in the register. <laughs> What's it like working with Tom Cruise? Say again? What's it like working with Tom Cruise? Actually, he's a true professional. He's a workaholic. He gets to work before everyone else. He finishes after everyone else. He calls me up at 10 o'clock at night when I've had a few beers. I'm like, oh, shit. <laughs> he's a workaholic. Uh, but he's very professional. He's very focused. And he learns quicker than anybody I've ever worked with. So he is, he is good at what he does. But he's got to the stage now. He's got 700 jumps. And he's at that complaint, complaint stage. Complaint stage? <laughs> Complacent stage is the word. Eh? So we have to keep pulling him back. No, you're not ready for that yet. But we do do some weird and wonderful stunts with him, and he just puts everything into him. So, yeah. He's it's good. For sure. <laughs> No, no, no. Technically, it was a nuisance factor. We didn't give him a mail. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Any more questions? The mic's coming to you. This is the film rigging work we do. So if you see us, uh, if you see buy a, a parachute from a rig company, don't jump it. <laughs> from a film company, don't jump it. We do weird and wonderful things. We cut all this up afterwards, but. Um, we need to change over uh, aluminium hardware to rubber hardware. When you're having a fight sequence, it's got to be rubber hardware. When it's in the wind tunnel, we use aluminium hardware. Stainless steel, obviously, for real. So this is how we change it over quickly. What was the question? Yeah. Um, quite clear, the message is um, this country needs to be more film friendly. That, yeah. That's, that's the message throughout CAA, British Skydiving, and so on and so forth. Um, a massive growing market. Um, and significant delays in pressing forward. You gave some timelines of how much you've pressed over the years. Um, do you see a breakthrough happening soon? None at the moment. At the moment, I know I work directly at the CAA, and that limits me a little bit, or I, I go abroad. If, if we had a section in the operations manual specific for film, oh, we could go to any local drop zone. You know, uh, but the, the British Skydiving's got to want it. They, they don't listen to me anymore. I complain too much. <laughs> The mic's over there, over the top there. Uh, what's the next thing? Uh, could you not run some of the smaller jobs in the UK under the auspices of, say, a display? Say again? Could you potentially, some of the smaller jobs to navigate some of the issues in the ops manual, could you not sort of run them through the auspices of, of like a display? Uh, we have done that, uh, and we can do that to a certain extent. It depends on uh, what's required, but you still govern them by British skydiving uh, display requirements, and, and, and again, that still restricts us so much. Um, and, if, and then they, they turn around and say, technically, it's not a display for the public, and then you, you've lost the argument. So we have tried it. I think... Uh, I think Mission 6, because as a parachute engineer, I got to do so much en engineering work. You know, I could build parachutes, build containers, modify them, halo auction equipment. That film had it all for me. I don't know about you. Oh, man, Mission 6, absolutely incredible. C-17, getting out of the desert with Tom Cruise, cracking. Yeah. Big mistake, though, 25 grand in a pair of shorts and T-shirts, big mistake. <laughs> <laughs> never do that. Yeah. Uh, and Ross, by the way, I did hire her to do belly flying. The director put her on back flying. That wasn't my job. And I was like, well, no, she, she doesn't do that. And Well, she is in this film. <laughs> but actually, she did a brilliant job as well. So sometimes we have to train people up and give them new skills. 
The speed flying out of Slovenia, I actually adored because, you know, I'm really getting into speed flying. Um, but again, we had to modify the equipment and camera kit. Anyone else? Do you ever do stuff for live? Sorry, the so mic. Mike, where's the mic? Yeah. Okay. For television and stuff, do you ever do things live? And is that possible to do? I can't hear you, mate. Sorry. Is it possible to do stuff live or does it all kind of need to be recorded? Does that ever happen? Can you? Do you well, generally speaking, um, it's, when it's a movie, it's, it's by the very nature of it, it's not live. Um, we've, not, we've just not been asked to do. Um, Here's a mic, Ray. But we've never been asked to do. Yeah. Fair enough. Um, yeah, I have been asked to shake my legs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, That'll come later. <laughs> Anyone else? No, it's good. Well, thank you for listening to us. Uh, we've just run out of time now. There's a little bit more video, so we'll let that run for a little minute. But thank you very much. <laughs> we'll start.